So welcome to the second to last talk of of tonight, and um, have the pleasure of having uh, with us on the stage Dieter Olstrate. And uh, Dieter is currently a member of the curatorial team convened by Adam Cinchik, the artistic director of the upcoming uh, uh, Documenta for Thin, which will take place in Athens and in Kassel uh, next year. Uh, Dieter, from 2012 until uh, 2015, he was a senior curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art of Chicago. And before, he worked for seven years as a curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Antwerp. Um, he's a very prolific writer. He wrote for many, many catalogs and magazines. And uh, he now lives in Kassel. So maybe we can also start from, <laughs> from the fact that uh, why you need to live in Kassel even if you how, uh, even if you spend all your life behind a screen. It's really important to be <laughs> um, physically in Kassel. Is that a question? Yes. Well, um, well, first of all, you have to live somewhere, you know. Um, it came with a job. It was a job. It was one of the. Uh, it was a job requirement to um, to live in Kassel. So, just a very quick question. So, every the whole world is out there, right? Thousands of people could be yes. following us online, right? Yes. So I have to watch my uh, language here. But anyway, um, it used to be the case that um, the artistic director was required to live in Kassel, and Adam, of course, you know, uh, brilliantly avoided that uh, indictment by moving to um, Athens instead. And I guess that, you know, I basically <laughs> was condemned to uh, do castle time on his behalf. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's a serious question and I'll have a, I'll give a serious um, answer. Um, it's important, you know, this is a big, it's a big exhibition. It, it takes part, it takes place every five years in this very particular place that is castle. And um, it's a project that historically is deeply rooted in the conditions of a post-war German city, located where it was, very close to the east-west German border. Um, so location and locale and context, you know, actual social, political, economic, historical context, cultural context and artistic context is very important to the uh, conceptualization of, uh, of an exhibition of this kind. So... Um, um, so yeah, I, I you know it only it only seems logical that I should live in the city that will receive close to a million visitors for this you know once every five year um, art event that you know everybody looks forward to so much. It seems, um, <clears throat> and and you know the one one of the things about castle is also that it's a um you know document there's a great deal of civic pride of course that castle derives from documenta this used to be different in the past uh, but for the last 10 20 years you know documenta is something that the that the citizens of castle uh, treat as their property as their cultural badge of honor and it is something that they're very anxious to share with a city like athens so um so it also is a matter of courtesy, diplomatic courtesy, to really, you know, live there, which you know is challenging at times. It's a, you know, it's a decidedly charmless provincial German town. Hi, Kassel. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it only yeah. seems logical. So in order to warm up and to start the conversation. Uh, I'm curious, to, I will uh, ask you a very general question regarding uh, the subject of this uh, project of L'Exposition Imaginaire. So um, uh, I'm curious to know if um, you believe that digitization has really um, uh, prompted a simultaneous compromise, at the same time reassertion of the boundaries of art, if this is something you, first of all, believe, and uh, um, how this affected your work as a, as a curator, as a writer, is like 
uh, something you are uh, interested to address directly or you see more as a kind of consequence? I mean, is something that you have to, to face because it's, it's, it's what it is? This culture of, you know, the, the pressure of the digital, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, if you see that now we are witnessing to a, um, um, a kind of end of something, as we also mentioned in the text, or a new beginning of, yeah. in terms of uh, the experience of artworks or the status of artwork or the, I mean, there are so many kind of um, topics around this, mm -hmm. uh, which if, of course is is a very big question. Um, well, you know, of course, I think it uh, it is the um, the prerogative of every generation of each of, of 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 each generation to, you know, fancy itself witness to a momentous revolution, like you know, an absolutely <clears throat> age-defining uh, paradigm shift. But you know, surely enough, with the advent of digital culture and the digitalization of the world in a way, or the virtualization of the world, the dematerialization of the world. Um, I mean, surely this has um, had a tremendous impact on art production and art consumption and, and on, on the culture of, of art uh, um, more generally. And, um, and it's something that maybe, you know, has of course been underway for quite some time. And actually you could look at the history of Documenta itself as somehow chronicling this evolution. Um, I remember going, my first ever documenta was uh, back in 1997, it was organized by um, Katarine David. And um, so this, you know, it's, it's 20 years ago, <clears throat> almost 20 years ago. And, you know, this was a documenta organized at a time when the digital and, and new media and the internet still looked like kind of utopian horizons. Um, the Orangerie, one of the uh, exhibition venues in Kassel, was given over uh, to the Critical Art Ensemble, people like Geert Loving, um, you know, the founders of Netheim, Pitt Schulz, like, you know, kind of the, the paladins of the digital revolution in arts and culture were, were welcomed very um, warmly in Kassel back in 1997. And, 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 you know, it must have been a time when, you know, the, the internet looked uh, like a very promising alternate um, universe still. And, and, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if this promise really materialized. I mean, you know, certainly, you know, digital culture has taken over entirely. And um, and you know, what, where, where do I stand with regards to this notion that it's the end of something and the beginning of something else? I mean, certainly, I feel like um, you know, we're kind of we we do live uh, in a watershed moment. Um, and we are witness in a way to a breaking point, but a breaking that is unfolding over the years. And in many ways, I, I feel uh, quite honestly that um, we are uh, experiencing one instantiation of this Hegelian specter, the Hegelian ghost of the end of art. Um, and so, for sure, yeah, I, I kind of share, well, I'm not sure if, I, if this is something that I share, maybe I'm the only one who really feels this, but uh, I certainly experience um, the pressure of the digital as something, or I experience it quite apocalyptically as something that uh, is, you know, as something threatening and, uh, and kind of ultimately uh, noxious and, you know. Um, but yeah, certainly, I mean, it's, as a philosopher, I, I was trained in, in, in philosophy. I'm, <clears throat> I'm not an art historian. I'm, I don't have any artistic training. I also never had any curatorial training, um, but was trained as a philosopher and, and uh, moving into the art world, kind of stumbling into the art world by accident. I was always deeply attracted to this, uh, to this you know, Hegelian fantasy of the end of art, this idea of the death of art. Um, it's as old as the idea of art itself. And it's a it's a it's a topic or or a, like a, um, a notion that I've explored over uh, time and again over the years in writing and sometimes also in curating a little bit more difficult, um, but yeah, right now <laughs> I do feel like um, it's really upon us. Uh, and I brought two books actually to kind of make that point a little bit. Um, 
two books that I was reading on the train here, uh, because I took the train from Kassel. There's a direct train from Kassel to um, um, to Vienna. It's a you know very potent reminder of how material the world really is. Um, so one book, which you know many of you maybe know, is simply titled After Art. It's by David Jocelyn. It's a very thin, but you know, packs a punch. It's a it's a it's a handsome little treatise, and. Um, this is, of course, something that I think I finished reading before the train stopped in Fulda. And um, then this one, of course, I, you know, 100 pages and nowhere yet. Uh, but this book is uh, called Likeness and Presence, A History of the Image Before the Era of Art by Hans Belting. Um, so I'm reading a book about the history of the image before the era of art, and then I'm reading a book that is just simply t titled After Art. And, of course, the title of Jocelyn's book is intended to be quite ambiguous, um, but I'm just taking it as a symptom that, you know, we are living at a time where um, artists and, 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 and people working in the art world have to contend with the notion that what they, the idea that they've rallied around for so many generations has, you know, basically um, come to its end. And, and so, so belting is a, um, writes the history of the image before the era of art in a way so he's writing in a, a history of, of, of image culture uh, and the era of art is something that you know very uh, predictably he he dates as emerging uh, in the 16th century in Renaissance Italy or you know the low countries <clears throat> and anyway what I wanted to say is that uh, um, both books in a way kind of um, you know, are, are histories of images as opposed to histories of artworks. And I think that that's a little bit where we are right now, you know. Um, you know, like this project seems to be more concerned with image culture than it is with, you know, kind of the idea of art as this thing that we've known for 100, 200, 300 years. Um, so my position is one of... Um, self-indulgent pessimism and, and, uh, and, you know, like classic Viennese cultural, um, you know, enjoyment of decline. Uh, you know, Karl Kraus, uh, Thomas Bernhardt, you know. I mean, it's, very, it's all very fitting that this should take place here. Um, so, yeah, I think art, yeah, art, yeah, I, so I think that art is coming to an end. Art is dead, and it's the Internet's fault. Because I, and I want to say this actually online, I fucking hate the internet. It's really, I can't fuck. it's, you know, it's really bad. Why? Well, Donald Trump and Brexit, so those are the first two uh, arguments out of the box, you know. <laughs> I think, uh, no, whatever. Of course I'm here because of the internet, because, you know, Nicolau sent me an email. He didn't have any pigeons anymore, you know. Um, but um, anyway, I think that overall, I do, yeah, I, I have. But this is just a matter of taste, and it's a matter of personal preoccupation, or, or it's a personal position. But I don't believe that um, digitalization has been all that interesting for the experience of art. Since you work uh, in a in a museum, I mean, both in Chicago and in Antwerp in how you were dealing with the collection within this kind of framework also because i mean the the problem of of the present is also that we we have a kind of hyper production of cultural material in terms of of works basically artists produce works but that be, most of the times they uh, they ended up in storage because some, there is no even enough space to exhibit them. So the thing is that um, most of the museums shows a minimum part of the collection, even with a with a trend that started already many years ago of um, changing continues the the collection. However, I think uh, maybe we need to live at least three other lives to, to see all the, all the works. And so, of course, now all the museums feel, uh, in a way, obliged to, to use 
the digital tools to um, yeah to digitalize the archive and to make a disposal of a, of a larger audience and so how was uh, your position regarding it working in a museum and dealing with with a collection an idea of a collection in terms of yeah how to share this with uh, with the audience yeah well um Sure, you know, if you go to the Met in New York, um, basically what you get to see, and if you want to see every single object and you want to look at every single object that's currently on view in the Met for, say, five seconds, which, you know, is too short for most of it anyway, then you'll probably need a couple of years to just make it through that one instantiation of their collection display. Um, and the Met famously is only able to exhibit 5 or 10% of their holdings. So what do you do with the rest, the other 95% or the other 90%? Um, obviously there, um, museums' digital parallel existences are very useful. Um, um, and you know, the same is true of a museum like the MCA or a museum like the museum in Antwerp, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Antwerp, even though I have to say that both museums have tragically underdeveloped websites with regards to their um, inventory. So um, I yet have to really come across, there's a couple out there, but there's few museums who can really b deliver this desire we might have to know what's in the vaults that we can go see. Um, <clears throat> and maybe the Met, you know, is probably kind of uh, leading the pack in this regard. Um, but, I don't know, this, this to me, in a, a you know, to, to, to basically inventory, a, uh, to catalog a collection online and to make it available to the general public is a great service, but it's information, you know, this is just, it's an, ex you know, this allows a viewer to experience an object as, uh, well, first of all, code, you know, literally code, like the image is basically like, uh, you know, is just algorithm. A, is an algorithm, but also secondly, codes in the literal, in, in, in the other sense of, you know, just the title and like inventory number and material and date and all that. Um, I mean, that's not, but that's not what, uh, <laughs> The experience of art has historically really revolved around. I, I, um, it's a very old-fashioned point, perhaps, but you know, I don't know why I should apologize for it. But uh, um, I believe that most, like you know, the vast majority of artists make, still make objects. Actually, you know, um, in fact, they are returning to objects with a vengeance. You know, I mean, you know, film images are just as objective in nature as a painting or an installation is. So anyway, what I wanted to say is that most artists, or most art is still produced to be experienced physically in space by somebody who's bodily present, right? So this is not something that the World Wide Web will ever be able to kind of replace. And, and in fact, I think that, you know, kind of the, the increasing pressure of information on the experience of art has had artists running back for very material types of production, very artisanal types of production. And, and you know, we were discussing this just earlier. Um, you know, the last five to ten years, if you would write the history of contemporary art production of the last five to ten years, what you would have to talk about is obviously the un stopping return of painting every year, always coming back, painting 2.0, just uh, around the corner, but then also, you know, ceramics, wood cutting, uh, textiles, like, you know, how many artists today are making tapestries, right? I mean, we could really fill an entire documenta with contemporary weaving or contemporary ceramics alone. Now, these were modes of production that 10, 15, 20 years ago were nowhere to be seen in the contemporary art field, not, you know, as defined by the critical mainstream. And I think that Documenta, again, is a good measure in this regard. The 1997 Documenta of Katrin David or the 2002 Documenta of Oku and Wezor were exhibitions that had very little patience for artisanal modes of production or artisanal modes of presentation for material. I mean, famously, Katrin David, um, her Documenta in 97 included two painters or three. Kerry James Marshall, 
Larry Pittman and David Reeb. And she refused to speak of these artists as people who make painting. They, she you know, very consistently referred to them as artists who produce images. He, you know, she wasn't interested in paintings as objects. And I think that was you know, very, and there wasn't anything shocking about this. It was just basically what, you know, that's what the time was like. And, and, and so, I don't think this is an answer to a question. I forgot the question. But, um, but what I want, to, yes, what I wanted to say is that, um, yeah, I don't know. I just don't did, believe did, it. Did you have any sound piece in, the, in, the, in Chicago or in Antwerp in the collection? Do we have a sound piece? Yes. Um, and because that is also how you can, if you're talking about paintings and objects, of course you can uh, digitize and present an image of it. But with a sound piece, I always wonder how you can like present in a in the digitalized kind of uh, archive of the collection. I mean, and this goes also. Uh, uh, back to a certain kind of uh, position of uh, artists which are uh, more and more kind of uh, questioning it through a certain attitude to the exhibition making, doing not only time-based work, which of course uh, happened mainly in the 60s and 70s, but also uh, doing time-based exhibitions like Pierre Wig. Pareno, all these type of artists. And so in that case, uh, I mean, the works, these exhibitions are very hard then to document, to create a kind of uh, history of it. So for the future. So I was, yeah, thinking about that. And if you, for example, I mean, if you are interested in this type of kind of artistic positions, because what you say, of course, is true that there is a, a big kind of trend and fashion of presenting this sort of very artisanal kind of works. Then at the same time, in the last uh, 15 years, we have witnessed this um, uh, big, uh, many, many artists uh, developing works based on kind of rewriting history and this also because we were talking about that before, but most of the the most iconic works of the of the sixties and seventies, especially like performance, were witnessed by a very limited number of people. So basically, are rumors, mm -hmm. yeah. and um, and they're and now yeah, and they're being remade. And now with the proliferation of images, actually you have artists that are trying to dig in this in this past and working and so that there is this you also wrote a text about this the, about this not storytelling storytellers as we mentioned in the previous talk but uh, about history telling and so i think this is another aspect which is uh, quite strong and visible and relevant in the in, if we are talking about the uh, the last 15 years in terms of artistic production you know, uh, you actually um, all of a sudden I have a, a, a I have a uh, like an aha at Leibniz. Um, you know, all of these young artists who are remaking art, the art from the 60s and 70s, like you know, some obscure Bulgarian performance artist who ate a hedgehog in 1968, um, and you know now and somebody is doing this again now. Like the funny thing about all of these reenactments and these reconstructions and repetitions and remakes is that the originals, of course, were not made for any, like, you know, there was never any kind of commercial reality what the, to what these people did. Like all of these performances and these gestures and these fleeting interventions were, um, you know, had zero monetary value while many of the reconstructors um, are never too shy to present these works at art fairs. So basically, <laughs> they're kind of cashing in on the originals, you know? Um, so if you, uh, if you remake a Bastian Adler piece, uh, uh, Bastian Adler, of course, never saw a dime of what he did. He was also not that interested, perhaps. Uh, but, you know, as an artist who is in the business of, or as an artist who's part of the reenactment industry, you're actually able to actually make money on the back of Bastian Adler. It's uh, an interesting 
thought that I just had, which is sparked by your observation. Well, uh, um, you asked about my position with regards to um, some of these. I mean, first of all, sound art. No, that's I, well, no, no. I, no, 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 was listen, not, no, no, no. I was I really re strictly related I, to the idea of how to document <laughs> and in this I, digitized <laughs> kind of archive of museums <laughs> about works as audio pieces sure. or... Well, so. I mean, a sound art piece is easily stored. I mean, it's... Uh, um, you know, during my time at the MCA, one of the pieces that was commissioned actually for the museum, or co-commissioned for the museum, was a Susan Phillips uh, uh, musical comp composition. But when I heard it in the museum, it always... I always thought it was suspiciously a lot like music. It was... <laughs> So I didn't understand what this, you know, how it was sound art. And there's another thing I want to say about sound art. So I live in, you know, I think it's fair, you know, we should entertain the crowd a little bit. It's not very big here, but it's, you know, potentially huge out there. Um, Especially in Castle. And I know, they are on my every word. So, and actually this is for the people of Castle. Um, so I live in Kassel. I live in the in the um, the house that was once historically occupied by the Grimm brothers. I live in the Palais Bellevue. It's a, it's a kind of small palatial structure from the early 18th century. <clears throat> on the on the third floor, the top floor, I live there with my um, partner. And um, so, first floor is where I live. Second floor, first floor, and ground floor are going to be exhibition venues. So every now and then, people ask, well, um, so I've, I've told my colleagues, okay, no sound art in this building, because I have to live here. <laughs> and, I mean, it sounds like a silly anecdote in, you know, just, you know, m me being, you know, just the usual jackass self, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> there's, there, there's, you know, I, I just... Um, it kind of leads to a broader point that I have made for as long as I've been active in the art world, and that's that uh, one of the really great things that I've always... What I like about museums or, or spaces that, you know, f feel like museums or want to be like museums, like a Kunsthalle here and there or a Kunstverein, is that uh, you walk into them and they deliver on this kind of old avant-garde promise that what you see inside the museum or this, the space of art is at least different from what you see everywhere else. So one of the problems of um, the invasion of digital culture into every pore of the art world is that it basically serves to duplicate the world as it exists outside, inside the museum space. So one of the last things I want to see when I walk into a museum is an artwork about Steve Jobs or somebody's Facebook account, or, you know, and I have, uh, this is, uh, um, yeah, I, you know. I love the Berlin Biennale, the last one. I didn't see it yet, and I'm going there in July to give a talk about pleasure, and I'm not sure how that's going to go, but, um, in fact, I've been asked to speak on a boat, and the great thing about this boat is that apparently people who come to listen to you get on the boat, and then the boat sails away, so you basically, they're completely at your mercy. So, I, you know, I will probably... <laughs> enjoy that moment of uh, unrestricted power. But anyway, what I, you know, sound art is, uh, well, I'm not going to say a really, I'm not going to, um, um, I'm not going yeah, to be, be an idiot about it, but, but the thing is that, um, uh, yeah, I just, uh, um, I, you know, I'm just wedded to this rather old-fashioned idea of art as, the negation of the world as it exists in a way and but the duplication of the world as it exists is not something that I wish artists would really engage in um, and um, many formal experiments of the last 20 years have unfortunately contributed heavily to the process of the duplication of the world as it exists outside of the museum inside the museum so I don't really see the point in that case of the museum anymore you know um, you know it, this is I'm just talking on my own behalf here um, I, what I like about a museum is that, you know, it can feel like a really great cemetery. It's quiet and, you know, nobody moves. Um, so there's no, you know, moving image, okay, but very, you know, slow. Um, so, but to, to answer the question of storage, I, you know, of course, um, 
you know the funny thing about all of these of of, uh, of artwork that is so dependent on media there's this dependency on 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 certain on electronic media has two problems on the one hand it um the problem is that you know many of the references that are that percolate in the world of electronic media date incredibly fast you know seriously 10 years ago there were people out there who made art installations about Britney Spears but you know there are people out there today who don't even know who Britney Spears is anymore um, so that's one problem right kind of like the, the 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 volatility of the references the cultural references that uh, that circulate in this field and then the second one is of course the the, the challenge of the carrier um, I remember that you know back in the mid 90s when Matthew Barney was the messiah of you know or was like the future of art that if you wanted to buy a Cremaster film you basically got a laser disc yeah. I mean Especially does anyone know deluxe box yeah like a laser disc I mean that's great you know that now in itself has become a completely fetish object that would look really well in the Wunderkammer of the Kunsthistorisches Museum and it's only 25 years ago or 20 years ago um, so it's a ch you know it's a um, these artworks or you know it's it requires it or it allows for a very for a for a boundless expansion of collecting power um but it also comes with uh, many you know challenges both of a pragmatic and a conceptual kind well, i think it's also a big challenge for many of the artists when you were referring to the to the 60s and 70s because they they never thought about uh, uh, facing the idea of how uh, to uh, collect this work or like the after. So also for them it's totally like they have to face a number of issues which is very uh, hard. So like what's happening to uh, like John Jonas for the work, since especially for works that are like performative works where they are performed by the artists. So, should we deliver kind of score scripts? Is this good or instead no? The works is is vanished. And and I think I wanted to to show um, a short clip of of a interesting for me example of of how to question the idea of documentation of reproduction of uh, works or artistic like um, experience which you cannot easily like um, reduce into an image so i would show this uh, clip by of steve paxton and simon fort in conversation was a they had a um, a conversation in uh, the red cat space and so this was not a performance was a dialogue uh, between the two of them and uh, What's his interest for me, I was really like amazed by it because when they mention a work, they were actually performing it. So, but then you feel that is a bit tricky because what is this? A reenactment, you are like performing a work as an artist is showing an image. And uh, I mean, it's a bit like the, um, I heard that when the mom acquired a piece of Tino Segal, actually the board of trustees had to see the work in order to acquire it. And so basically there was a stage performance only for that, but then it was not a work. or So it meant to be a sort of documentation of the work to them, but then this happened in the space of the museum. So this is kind of tricky things but is a kind of i mean at least i found it quite interesting in terms of i mean our practical examples that provokes a number of issues about yeah yeah maybe we can uh, yeah watch it and then yeah comment i saw this arrangement i thought oh good i'm going to get to go on the floor <laughs> which I, I couldn't really do when I come to performances here. And I, <laughs> it's a nice floor. The first time I saw Simone doing that, it was 
in the Merce Cunningham studio after a class. She was the only Merce Cunningham student to finish off the technique class by crawling <laughs> on the floor. Be I there, just happened to Sam. be there and I just happened to remember it was 86 because that was the year I premiered uh, a solo that I premiered there. Yeah. So, could you dance that now somehow <laughs> a little bit however you could? My solo? Yeah. Can you play the Goldberg Variations? Yes. <laughs> the best I can. Okay. Ideas. <laughs> Both you and Cunningham were asking people to stop a, a life process. It's like, do not breathe while you're dancing my work. Well, it's changed a little bit now, but, but not really. Because <laughs> now what's hard is when we do those pieces, if I do it with dancers, they've gone through all the somatic stuff. <laughs> so everything is... Now I'm they... about to touch. Now I'm touching. Now I can feel the bone under the skin. And we used to just... <laughs> so we didn't know we were touching in the, in the way that they do now. Well, we did. It's like, but it was like you pick up a glass of water to have a drink of water. You don't like, oh. Yes, you do. <laughs> uh, you see what I mean? <laughs> And I remember the first time I saw people that I was going to be performing with, improvising with, and they were doing contact improvisation, and I went up and touched them, and I went, woo! <laughs> <laughs> because? Because they, they had become a, media, a, a, a particular kind of medium. It's quite wonderful, but um, it was a surprise. And Christy Swain was one of those people. I think that contact, when I think of contact improvisation and your role in it, it's like... <laughs> Thank you, Simone. Gosh. <laughs> That's got to be in the book. <laughs> I don't think it should have been a book. I think there should be some other medium which involves the sensations of human bodies and the color and sound of human perceptions and it should almost be like a filmic medium that we should work in. But more than filmic, because it should... It should... It should... I love it. It should have some of that in it. Yeah. 
It's not so different from Jeff Wall giving a talk about his work and showing images. Why? Because this is the art they do. So if you, you know, I mean, obviously they could have shown moving image footage of their younger and more agile selves. But um, I mean, they're, you know, they're dancers, performers. They, uh, they obviously know how to deliver, you know, the bodies is what, um, but Jeff Wall is not presenting the original work, the physical work in the in the in the room when he's doing his he's showing a reproduction of Well he's a photographer, so he could actually in some cases he'll be able to show you uh an image that derives from the same well, a negative doesn't exist anymore because he's been a digital photographer himself now for twenty years, twenty five years. But um yeah, I, I, I um, but I wanted to, you know, just kind of come back to your point about, uh, or the, the remark you made about Tino Segal's work being bought by the, uh, by MoMA. I mean, you know, here's a practice that is obviously rooted in a tradition of art making that came of age in the 60s and 70s, and that came of age out of a desire also to make art unable for collection so you know when <laughs> when you know these the, 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 these the icons of the 60s 70s neo avant-garde conceived of all of these gestures they did so <clears throat> to defy the institutional desire to own everything um, <clears throat> so why MoMA should feel like it has to have that as well is beyond me I mean you know they can explain Glenn Lowry is probably watching, um, but um, but of course, I mean, it, it has to be possible to collect dance, just like it is possible to, you know, archive a library of music. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. In terms of on a theoretical level, you don't find it so interesting. Um, I mean, it's an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting conceptual conundrum on the level of cultural economy. But it is also, uh, you know, inevitably it reduces the, the the question of what you're looking at to how it can be possessed and and uh, redistributed. I, you know, it's it's like um, you know, we're in Vienna today. I walked by one of a hundred houses that Beethoven appears to have lived in. Uh, while he was in Vienna, and uh, of course it has a plaque, and um, it was the house where he composed Fidelio, and um, there's no way of knowing what Fidelio Beethoven heard in his head or first heard when it was premiered in this one theater in 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 uh, in Vienna in 1804 or 1806 or whatever. All we have are a hundred recorded interpretations or maybe a thousand recorded interpretations. And that's just the nature of the medium. Just like the nature of the medium of dance is that, um, you know, it has to be reenacted, and it can be done so academically and successfully, or, 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 or academically or successfully. It really depends. But I don't, you know, um, um, but it's not. I mean, those, but I don't think these are, but I don't really kind of think of those forms or those rebellions, in a way, as contributions to the dematerialization of the art object. Um, because, you know, in the case of uh, Simone Forte and Steve Paxton or, you know, anyone else of that generation, I mean, there was a very clear sense that the experience was, you know, very deeply embodied in a way that is not as present in many of the contemporary remakes of these of these gestures, you know. Um, I mean, these people, you know, it's it's uh, it's yeah, imminence. And uh, talking about the the experience of the primary experience of the work, like the physicality of the work, the idea of the original and the copy. Uh, 
I mean, all these issues were, were very present in the, and, uh, uh, and visible in, uh, in the exhibition that Germano Schellen did in Venice, uh, when Atheus becomes forms like it, when he reenacted or repeated or whatever, restaged. And you also contributed uh, to the catalog. And um, I don't know what was your um, uh, feeling about that. I mean, like the primary like feeling when you, for the first time, you visit the exhibition. But for me, it was very uh, kind of um, weird because even if they were the real works in that case, or was not kind of uh, remake, then I uh, I felt as I was in a three-dimensional book, and I look at that more as a images than real works. But this is a very personal, uh, so was was pretty weird, and um, so and I think was more interesting kind of as a real essay than as an exhibition by itself, which. Uh, so, I don't know, I'm curious to hear your... Well, I think it was absurd, uh, absolutely absurd. But, you know, it's funny that this was in 2013, during the 2013 Venice Biennial, and, um, and it's telling, of course, that it was probably the one, well, it's not, it wasn't a pavilion, right? It was in the Ca, Ca Corner in, uh, um, of the Canal Grande, and it was one of the exhibition venues that you had to queue the longest for to get into and you know the book was sold out within a day and so you could basically of course sense a strange or kind of like you know an, a, like a hard to define public desire for the real thing or 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 you know or an appro approximation of of, of uh, it, it felt a little it's like going actually to go back to music it's like going to um a concert of Mozart played on period instruments, right? Um, I mean, it was mannerist. It was just a folly. I don't really kind of think of it much. But of course, I mean, it's interesting to kind of look at it as a symptom, which is the way I mostly look at, uh, at art anyway, or as cultural expressions anyway, as symptoms of underlying diseases and afflictions and pathologies, you know? Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I, I, but you know, the, the question of the copy and the original um, is, 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 uh, is, is the more important one here, of course. And I think, you know, also to kind of like bring this back to the initial, to the point of departure of this project. Um, and, um, you know, I don't want to come across as a Luddite, you know, uh, when I declare the internet to be the enemy of art. I mean, obviously not. Um, but, um, you know, conceptual art in many ways took root in places like Chile and Vancouver and, you know, Taiwan in the 60s and 70s because the only way that artists there had access to information about art was through reproductions, images, you know, magazines, art forum, basically, right? You know, that's how art traveled to the far ends of the earth. And so, you know, it's qualitatively different now, but the principle is the same in a way, you know? So it's basically a stream of information, but it's still information and not the real thing. And I'm not, you know, I'm not a fetishist and I'm, I'm not like this also doesn't have, you know, I'm not, I'm, this is not a plea for commodity uh, capitalism because if we talk about the renewed enthusiasm for artisanal modes of production in the art world we also have to accept that this enthusiasm emerged at the time of you know this crazy boom in the art market you know of course all of a sudden people want to buy for manual labor again or pay for manual labor again because it was money to do it um, but um, but you know I mean I like what I wanted to say is that uh, I mean you know I just it, you know, nothing beats, nothing beats being in a body in front of another body. And this other body can be a human body or it can be a dead thing on a wall, but it is still a body. And like the foundational principle of the artistic experience is the encounter with this other thing that does not, that just does not, um, you know, it, 
that that I don't think um, revolutions in information technology have really fundamentally altered. And I think this is a nice way to perhaps invite somebody to contradict me. Or not. What time is now? Do you still have it's, time? It's, it's five to six, so it's, we're close. No, I have the last uh, kind of... Uh, okay, good. Curiosity. Because the, like the other day, I mean, uh, yeah, two days ago, um, I've read this um, short essay by Douglas Copeland that was published on Eflux Journal. I don't know if you have read it. No. Uh, titled, what if, what if there is no next big thing? As a question mark. And um, so I just took some experts. And uh, he says, what if tech itself is the next big thing in the art world? What if, what if tech, technology, tech, what if tech itself is the Duchamp urinal in the 21st century armory show? Is the notion that technology equals art depressing? Are you a hater to think such things? Which is better art? A performative piece whose movements are informed by real-time Los Angeles traffic patterns or amplenaire watercolors of delicate songbirds done on a foggy morning? Does it drive you crazy when autocorrect always flags the word performative? If human beings stop creating new technologies as of today, would the art world crater overnight? Last month I had a look at a new system that 3D scans flat but textured surfaces such as paintings. The technicians who created it were trying to figure out ways to use it. Their solution was to license and scan Van Gogh paintings, 3D print them, and then sell them for $40,000 each at a local shopping mall catering to Chinese clientele. Mm -hmm. So, um, any comments? Any comments? Well, I mean, of course, Douglas Copeland is, a, is you know, one of the great chroniclers of my generation's um, non-existential angst. And, uh, you know, he's written some nice books and, you know, he can string together a word or two. But we all know that, you know, in, for some time now, he's also dabbled in art making and not very successfully so. So if Douglas is watching... Um, you know, I, I actually, uh, yeah, so I don't, you know, I don't really know what to do with that, but um, is tech the next, new, next thing? I mean, well, it's, you know, the world is tech, you know, like we, you know, the, um, any apology coming out of the art world that um, technology is the all-determining factor of a contemporary life is capitulation for those powers, for Silicon Valley. I don't know who of you watched the NBA Finals. Maybe Forrest did. But, you know, the Cleveland Cavaliers, you know, the, 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 uh, the Knights of the Rust Belt, you know, like an old industrial, you know, um, wasteland in uh, the American Northeast winning from the Golden State Warriors, the team that was basically invented so that, you know, um, Mark Zuckerberg can root for a, for, for a sport. Um, it's just like sweet, it's sweet, it's sweet vindication um, for, yeah. Anyway, so no, I don't like, I, I, I you know, technology, you know. Yeah, we need more pull tech than a tech word. We need, we need, we, we actually, I, I don't, you know, there's not that many, uh, sometimes I, feel, I, sometimes I wonder to myself, like, where the fuck have the intellectuals gone, you know, in, 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 in kind of like the cultural field or the field of art at large, you know, all I, you know, yes, I mean, there's a lot of tweeting and, yeah, is somebody tweeting that about right the now? the difference it's, in terms of volume between this and this also. Yeah, look at, yes, look at this. Uh, look, look. <laughs> this is after art. It's not very much, is it, right? And then this is before art. Well, I mean, there's a more time there, I guess. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I just don't, yeah. yeah. So thank you. Maybe to, um, <laughs> to close the conversation, we can play the other clip, which is kind of... 
And in the meantime, if there's any questions ah, from yeah, anyone, oh, questions geez. are welcome. Yes, we can watch the the, the, the clip without any yeah sound or something. Yeah. Are there any questions from anyone? Vituperation. So basically, the clip is uh, is was. Um, a concert at the Coachella Festival of Tupac Shakur, a live concert of Tupac Shakur as a hologram in front of a real audience. So there were actually thousands of people reacting to an image. But they, they knew that was an image, of course, because Tupac is dead, but it doesn't matter yes, in a way. Yeah, but this is what Helms Belting talks about in this book. Yeah, that's it's people why. who think that an icon of the, Ma of the Virgin Mary is the Virgin Mary. So we are closing with the unspelling. Yes. No, no, this is. I mean, this book is titled Likeness and Presence. The funny thing is also Snoop Dogg is entering the stage and having a duet with the, uh, with Tupac, I think. Snoop Lion. Yeah. Okay, that's it. No, no more questions. Nothing.